Hi, everyone. Good to be with you. My name is Steve, if you're a visitor here. Um, I'm the interim lead pastor at the moment. Um, great to be sharing God's Word with you, which we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, there's communion today as well, so there's communion tables uh, back and the side, and I'll give you some instructions on that a little later, but it's always good to have communion, share communion together after we hear God's Word and respond in, uh, with communion. So we're going to do that. <clears throat> it is good to be with you. I was driving here this morning and a car went past me about 25 k's over the limit with a massive I love Jesus sticker on the back. It was just like, I need Jesus maybe, but yeah, um, that was funny. Uh, but it does show the gap between what we think we are and the direction we're going and how we're going in that direction. And we're going to look at our series Purpose, What Do You Think You're Doing in a Minute? And we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 5, um, because that's where we're starting. Ephesians 5, uh, 1 to 21. And we're well into our series purpose. What do you think you're doing at this stage? So I'm going to read the Bible, give a bit of a quick uh, over altitude look of where we're headed, and then pray, and then we're going to look at this passage in particular, in particular one issue around it that's right at the center of this passage. So let's read the Bible together, Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, we're in our series, Purpose. What do you think you're doing? It's the second half of Ephesians. And uh, the images of someone walking, because so much in the Bible and in the New Testament uses the metaphor of walking to describe the way we live our lives. Uh, the first psalm uh, in the whole uh, of the Psalms, Psalm 1, very famously starts, and it sets up the whole of the Psalms by this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And that other uh, great biblical text, uh, Walk This Way by Run DMC and Aerosmith, telling you how to walk. And the New Testament is no exception. Ephesians is full of walk language. And the passage today starts with a hinge verse uh, that we looked at. Now, the Bible obviously wasn't cut up into chapters and verses when it was first written, but these verses have landed in chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And that's a hinge that completes one part of what Paul was talking about, about walking in love over the last few weeks. And Paul is going to uh, talk about another way of walking. So there's that verse, therefore be imitators and walk in love. And he's wrapping that up. And now he's moving on to talking about Two different ways of walking. Walk as children of light, verse 8, and then look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, in verse 15. So it's very easy. Walk in light and walk wisely. Walk in wisdom. Paul is telling the Christians, the you individually and the yous, all of yous, 
to walk in a light-filled, wise way. And he's doing that in the context of a world which walks in a dark-filled, foolish way. (laughs) Hold on to that thought, because the church, Christians, their way of walking does not come in a vacuum. It is not an uncontested way of walking. The Bible says, walk this way, and the world says, actually, that's stupid. Walk this way. And so you are always, as it seems in the Bible, caught between these options. Walk as children of light, walk wisely. And the churches that Paul is writing to live in cities in which the Christian way of walking is not the normal way of walking. Wisdom and light are not taken for granted in Ephesus or the cities around it, any more than it's taken for granted here in Perth. And they're especially not taken for granted in the area of sexuality, which means that Ephesus seems like it would have a lot to say to a city like Perth, wouldn't it? The book of Ephesians. The passage touches on some other issues that we're looking at, but the key issue here is sexuality. Which direction are you going to walk in when it comes to sex in the city of Ephesus, in the city of Perth? A light-filled, wise way of walking in a world that is dark and foolish. That's what it's calling for. So we pray, and then we're going to specifically look at something in this passage. Father God, please give us wisdom and courage as we hear this to walk in a light-filled way as your people. We pray uh, that any are here today who aren't your people, that they will listen to this and hear what we're saying about these matters and realise that the church has a different way of walking to the rest of the world. I pray that you give us uh, courage and insight to walk your way and also give us the desire to do so as well as we hear your word. Amen. You may not be able to see what it says on the screen fully, but it says, life is short, have an affair. Life is short, have an affair. Ashley Madison is an adultery website that prides itself on being discreet to the 36 million people who are signed up to it. Now, the men have to pay by a credit card to be members of Ashley Madison. Women get to sign up for free. Because guess which direction it's weighted down? (laughs) More men sign up than women, so they thought they'd throw in a freebie. They had a surplus of men. And it's sophisticated imagery. Shh. Smart, savvy, modern. Shh. No one knows. Life is short. Have an affair. And it was all going so well, so swimmingly, until this. Life after the Ashley Madison affair. In 2015, hackers first stole the complete database and then made a public declaration that they were going to release all of that information in six weeks' time. Shh. Can you imagine those six weeks? Those six excruciating, terrifying, sleep-deprived, energy-sapping, horrifying weeks for men and women whose names were going to be published and that everyone was going to be able to read. 37 million people waiting for the axe to fall. And true to their word, that's what the hackers did. Six weeks later, they released all of the data publicly. Divorce, sackings, Heartache, suicide. I read one particularly harrowing case of a minister who committed suicide and his wife had said he could have had grace but he took a different option. The fallout was enormous, costly and painful. You see, what had been considered smart under the cover of darkness by so many people was now revealed as foolish when it was brought into the light. The hackers did not change any of the data on the website to make people look foolish, did they? They simply exposed the data. And the folly was there for all to see. Because light exposes dark. Wisdom exposes folly. People walking in folly and darkness were shown up for what they actually were. Children of darkness. Children of folly. Even though the ad looked so sophisticated... You can imagine the fallout. 
And you would think that in the light of that scandal, with all the pain and heartache associated with it, that Ashley Madison would have gone belly up broke. None of it. They're back 30-odd million clients. <laughs> and this is one of their ad campaigns recently. Ashley Madison gives you one more reason to go running in the morning. Great for your health, if not your marriage. I run 100 k's a week. I've got enough reasons to get up to run 100 k's. Great for your health, if not for your marriage. Ashley Madison is not simply encouraging people to walk in darkness and folly, but to literally run in that direction. We're picking up the pace, people. We're picking up the pace of stupidity and darkness. And it feels like that in our culture, doesn't it? Then when it comes to sexuality and sexual folly, the culture is picking up the pace. It's not walking anymore towards folly and darkness. It's running there. Sexual sin is not picking up the pace. It's picking up the pace, not walking, but running. Running in the direction of folly and darkness. And as God's people, we're living in the midst of Ephesus, Perth, whatever city you want to call it, and we're being told by the Bible to walk against that flow in wisdom and light. And I think it feels a bit like that. <laughs> Running in the opposite direction of everyone else. Pushing your way through this crowd. It's impossible, it seems. The flow of pornography, which is available, anonymous and affordable, in a way that it never was. The flow of the sexual identity issues. The flow of every second Netflix show, which you kind of got to check in the corner, what is in this before I start watching it and settling down with popcorn. The flow of raunch culture. The flow of schools teaching things that you as Christians are going, I don't want my kids to believe. Impossible, isn't it, seems. What could Paul, in his day, back in the ancient day, possibly know about how hard it is for us to walk in light and wisdom when things are so much worse. Yet the pagan world of Paul was exactly the same. He's writing to, among others, the church in Ephesus, and the citizens of Ephesus worshipped a multi-breasted fertility gold god called Diana or Artemis, Diana of the Ephesians. You can read about it in Acts. And sex was part of the trade. Now, sexuality has changed its meaning in some respects over time. In the ancient world, it was about power, not consent. Christianity gave consent to the world of sexuality where the power structure determined who you could have sex with. And it was about function. It didn't matter who you did it with and how you did it. It didn't change. It didn't make you homosexual. It didn't make you heterosexual. It didn't make you bi. It was just a thing you did. The modern world is about consent and identity, but it was just as much then against the flow of what God has called us to in sexuality as it is now for God's people. And I want you to notice that our world hasn't changed that much, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. As is proper among saints. Notice that. He doesn't say, those things must not be named among you because we're first century people <laughs> and we haven't reached the era of high-speed internet porn. No, it's as proper among saints, holy ones. There in Ephesus, there were those who were unholy living this way and there were those who were called to be holy living this way. And sexual immoral immorality, impurity and covetousness, by that I think it's saying those secret sexual desires, idolatry in the sexual area, must not even be named among you. Must not even make the pages of Christianity Today or the New York Times, which they seem to be doing, because they are being named among us in churches. No, that's not proper among the saints, says Paul. It's a divide. Saints going in that direction. Everyone else heading in that direction, <laughs> walking against the flow. 
It's named among everyone else, says Paul, but not you, not you. Let it not be named. It must not be named among you. And Paul reinforces that, doesn't he? Where he goes, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving, which are out of place. Filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. There are plenty of places in Perth, probably last night, where filthiness, foolish talk, and crude joking were right at home. (laughs) But they're out of place among God's people. And notice that those things are to be replaced. They're out of place, but nature abhors a vacuum, so they must be replaced by thanksgiving, gratitude to God. Filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking are out of place. In fact, those things, I think, are gateway drugs to sexual immorality, or they're at least the tip of an iceberg that something's going on. They're the start, and when we see them, or even imbibe in them, we need to be careful. When we find ourselves in places where those things are not out of place, we should kind of take care. When I was 18, I went to Curtin University to do a degree, and I was a journalism major. Journalists are the most godly, humble, self-reflective people I've ever met. (laughs) And it all started at university. And my experience as an 18-year-old growing up in church was I was not the potty mouth. It took me a year and a half in that place with those people. And I remember the day distinctly when I went, you know what? I am. I am. Because I've been in that place with those people. And I'm fairly quick-witted and keen to string snappy lines together. And those are things I still have to attend to in my life. And I can trace that back to being in that place. We must pay careful attention. Because it becomes easy to walk that way when we're in the places where those things are not out of place. So let me ask us, given our lives, and you have to go to Babylon tomorrow morning, in the world that you're in, the world that's walking that way, how are you going? Are you, by the word of God and the people of God and prayer, laundering those things out of your walk? Because let's not be more pious than Jesus and think they don't affect us. Are you countering those places with this place, with these people, with regular meetings, with God's people, where thanksgiving is the norm? Well, at least I hope thanksgiving is the norm when you get together as God's people and there isn't foolish talk or covetousness or filthiness. For every Netflix show that drops the F-bomb, for every comedy series that only gets its laugh from innuendo... Are we beguiling ourselves that a steady diet of that won't change us? Because those things were just as common in Paul's day, but in different forms. The problem was the same. But of course, that means if the problem's the same, and it is a problem, then the solution must be the same. And I want you to notice the word that comes up. But instead, (laughs) Thanksgiving, but instead... You see, our solution as God's people is not, okay, let's just give in against the tide and we'll just go and run with the pack. Nor is it to hide away and going, I'm so scared. God didn't see the 21st century coming. It sort of caught him by surprise. It's but instead. It's to walk against the flow. And Christians often oscillate between the walking with the pack assimilation, oh, let's just go with the flow, and the hiding away, sort of buying a property up in the hills with cyclone fencing and spam and beans and shotguns and waiting for the zombie apocalypse. We don't want to do either of those things. 
But instead, somehow God has empowered us to do the but instead stuff in a culture like this. Because I said it a couple of weeks ago, God does not call us to obedience without equipping us for obedience in every area of life. There's no point at which you can say, well, God, you've sorted out that in life and you have provided something for me there and you provided something for me there, but this thing, I'm on my own. Not true. What does it say? For at one time, you were darkness. Use. <laughs> but now use are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. What enables you to walk as children of the light? We are light in the Lord. God has in Christ done something to us. He has made us light. <laughs> we do not get there by our own efforts. The Bible is clear. We are rescued from darkness. We do not extricate ourselves from it by our own power. That's why we read in the book of Colossians, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you you can qualify yourselves, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Do you know what happens when you find yourself over time as a Christian walking more and more in the light? You don't pat yourself on the back. Gee, I'm doing well. We praise God giving thanks to the Father. We were in helpless darkness, and he has rescued us. He has qualified us to share in the light, a light-filled inheritance. He has given us the power to walk in the light. That's why we read all those, but instead. And not only does it make us thankful to God for what he's done for us, it stops us scorning other people who are walking in darkness and folly because we realize we would be too if God had not rescued us. That's the gospel. The minute we start to scorn other people when we see sexual sin and the shame and despair or even the pride in it, the minute we start scorning that, we forget that we would be there but for God. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. And it goes through the passage, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, expose them. Verse 15. Look carefully how you walk, not as wise, unwise, but wise. Verse 17. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. God gives us the power to, but instead, so to speak, to walk against the flow of 21st century Perth or 1st century Ephesus. It's always Babylon out there as you go off tomorrow. But God has given us the power to live as light. He does not call us to what he has not equipped us for. And if you're struggling or feeling that it's hard to go against the flow, then spend time talking to other Christians. Talk with us. Talk with someone. And we'll help you to see what it means for you, in your context, to be children of light. We don't have to give in to sin on a personal level. We've been brought into the light, so we walk as a child of the light. And we don't have to sin on a corporate level. How we live with each other can be light-filled and show the world something different. And by that I'd say, when it says have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to placard Parliament. Though it may. That wasn't on the table in Ephesus, okay, in the first century. It means the very church itself, the very Christian themselves living in the workplace, or working, or together... Our very presence exposes darkness by just the fact that we are light. We come here to be filled up, to be encouraged by God, to go out to, to be light, to be those lifeboats I talked about last week, going out wherever you are. 
And that exposes folly just by your very presence. That's the encouragement. Now, I've been circling those two standout verses in the middle, verses 5 to 7, but I'm going to land on them again. Remember Ashley Madison, life is short, have an affair. And part of that is right. Life is short. Life is short. And not only short, verse 16 says, the days are evil. Life is short and the days are evil. And we know that the days are evil because Ashley Madison says that the answer to the shortness of life is to have an affair. The answer to the confronting full stop that will bring your life to a grinding halt in death is to have sex with someone illicitly. That looks smart and sexy and if we keep it in the darkness... And with any luck, your short life will end without anyone ever discovering you had an affair. (laughs) How smart is that? That's a win. But look at the warning in verses 5 and 6. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is a covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. You may be sure of this. Every other message might be saying to you, it's smart, no one knows, no one knows. And they sound so sure. After all, who's going to find out? But that's wrong. Even without the 2015 exposure of Ashley Madison's site by hackers, Something else is at play here. There is another age to come after this short life. The kingdom of God and Christ in fulfillment. Don't squander your inheritance on Ashley Madison thinking. Because the kingdom of God is up for grabs. And it says here that sexual sin like that will bar you from entry to that kingdom. No matter if you're a member here at North Coast, no matter if you lead a growth group, no matter what it says on your door at work, no matter if you're the preacher here at North Coast Church, sexual immorality and impurity will bar people from God's kingdom. And Paul says, of that you can be sure. And Paul has to say, you may be sure to Christians in Ephesus and Christians in Perth, because sometimes we need convincing, don't we? Sometimes the flow of bodies come in the opposite direction on that race makes it seem like we're the ones missing out when life gets tough. That we're on the wrong side of history when we say that marriage is ordained by God between a man and a woman. That we're on the wrong side of history about porn or consent being the only thing that matters. But it's not just our views that matter, of course, is it? It's our actions. Paul does not say that those who agree that sexual immorality is wrong are those who inherit the kingdom. He says, if you don't practice what's good and true and right, you don't inherit the kingdom. And here's the worst place to possibly be. To disagree openly in the light with something that you would practice in the dark. Walking in the dark while talking light. Walking in the dark while talking light. And hasn't that brought down too many people over the centuries and in the past year? Tut, tut, tut. Google, Google, Google. (laughs) In fact, it's so important that we realize that, that Paul goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. The pr biggest problem with sexual sin is not that you might end up divorced, unemployed, or shamed by the newspaper. The biggest problem is that God's wrath is going to visit those who practice it. Life is short, says God. Repent. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Let no one deceive you with empty words. No one. Not the world. Do not let the world deceive you with empty words and bright color. The cultural flow about sex, that flow that you are walking against, the one that says that love is love, or that your sexual freedom is your core identity, or that consent is all that matters that you, in this world about sex. That deception is something we're pushing against all the time, and it gets a lot of money, time, government, and legal power, and cultural power thrown in its direction, and we have to walk against it. But don't let false teachers or Christian celebrities who've caved in on this shape your thinking either. Don't let them deceive you. By far, one of the most frustrating and distressing situations is the deception from those who once espoused walking in the light. Celebrities, Christian celebrities, who suddenly go on Instagram and go, yeah, nah, <laughs> to Christian views of sexuality that they'd held to and written books about for years. I thought Christianity was about being sexually pure, but now I can see it's about freedom and liberty to do what you want. Guess what? I'm too doing that too. <laughs> it's deceptive. And they are proving themselves to be sons and daughters of disobedience if they do it. And God's wrath will visit them for it. But here's the thing. Do you know the person most likely to deceive you with empty words in this matter? You. You. Me. Grant Morrison writes for the DC World Comics. And he says, We live in the stories we tell ourselves. We live in the stories we tell ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I can tell myself some exceptionally deceiving stories if I want to live in them. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart. Your heart. So the question has to be, what stories are we telling ourselves by which we could deceive ourselves, stories that we might find ourselves inhabiting if we tell those stories to ourselves long enough. Here's some stories I prepared earlier. Perhaps the story of my wife doesn't give out any longer, so porn's a good substitute. Well, my husband is emotionally stunted and disinterested in me, but that newly divorced man at work or hooking up is the way I'll keep my sexual urges in check because I'm years away from getting married. I'm sure we've heard those stories, maybe even started to tell ourselves those stories. You see how self-deception works? The wrong stories, empty stories, empty words that get us walking in darkness, letting our fingers do the walking across the keyboard in the dark or actually walking past the desk at work where that person sits that gives you that feeling that your partner no longer does. And God says, walk as children of light. And one of the ways you might have to do that that week is go, I'm not going to walk past that desk. If we say, it's okay, I'm just going to wander over here for a while, we are deceiving ourselves with empty words, deceiving ourselves that the wrath of God is a long way off or even non-existent, or that I can be smart about this because it's wise under the cover of darkness. But the command is this, isn't it? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them before they get exposed in a way that you may not want it to. 
expose them to the light of God's word, and if necessary, expose them to a trusted person who's walking in the light to help you if this is an issue for you. You see, the biggest crime of God's people in the Bible is a lack of fruit. A tree that looks like it's fantastic, but has nothing on it. Take no part, verse 11 and 12, in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. It's very easy to tick all the right religious boxes, attend all the sacrifices like Israel did, but Israel, the vine, the fig tree, was barren. And Jesus comes to Israel and sees the temple very busy. And he sees sheep and cattle and money and a fantastic building. And he walks out and goes up the hill and he's looking down at that and he sees a fig tree, which is a symbol for Israel, and there's nothing on it. He exposes it. He calls the lie to the story that Israel is telling itself. And he will call and expose the lie of the stories we tell ourselves if we too are fruitless because there is no non-fruit budget offering for Christianity. I'll take the non-fruit option, thanks. (laughs) He will expose it either here and now in his grace toward us or then and there in his judgment. The call to us as Christians is this. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul conflates several Old Testament passages from Isaiah with what is thought to be an early Christian hymn. Wake up. Get up from death. Christ will shine his light. Use your time well. Tell yourselves this story. Tell each other the story of the gospel. In fact, isn't that what he goes on to say to do? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. But instead, the antidote to thinking I want to walk in the darkness is not self-flagellation. It's turning around and walking in the light with each other, replacing filthiness with faithfulness, replacing foolish talk with fulsome singing, replacing crude joking with words that honour Christ Jesus. Walk as children of light, walk as wise people in an unwise world. Life is short. Of that, there is no doubt. But the solution is not to have an affair. The solution is not to walk foolishly in the dark. The solution is to live in the light of Christ, to walk as wise people because the days are evil. It does feel like that, doesn't it? You're pushing against it individually, as the people of God. But we are children of the light, and God has equipped us for the obedience to which he has called us. Life is short. Walk wisely on the light. Because on that day, when all is exposed, we will fear no shame, and Jesus will usher us into his light-filled kingdom. Amen. It feels like a good time to take communion, does it not? If you get to the end of a sermon and it never feels like a good time to have communion, then the gospel has not been preached to you because you want to respond to the gospel soberly, but hopefully, because this message hits us all because we know what we are like.